Hello, welcome to um, this afternoon of showcasing the senior art thesis exhibition SOAR on, on behalf of Fine Arts Programming and the CSB SJU Art Department. Uh, I, I really um, do wanna welcome you to help us celebrate 11 art seniors. And uh, the exhibition opened yesterday and will run through May 11th in the Alice R. Rogers and Target Galleries at the St. John's Art Center, uh, located on the campus of St. John's University. I'm Jill W. Kuhn, the Gallery Manager for Fine Arts Programming at the College of St. Benedict and St. John's University. I'm delighted to have worked with this group of artists in the last weeks to help install their final exhibition. The final art is the culmination of many elements encouraging each senior to find his or her voice. And it's when that final mark is made or the image is printed or the kiln is open that the ending really becomes the beginning. I believe in um, a new level of perspective emerges uh, for the creator when he or she steps back and is able to observe the art in a professional gallery setting. And these individual artists that are sharing their work with you today uh, definitely have found their voices. This exhibition sings with their resilience, their creativity, focus, endurance, strength, and individual artistry. And I really wanna congratulate each and every one of you. Uh, I'll share with you today what the schedule of events will be um, as, as we do our artist talks. After I complete this greeting, Joe Singwald, the faculty moderator for the senior seminar class this semester, will share some insights about the, this year's seniors and teaching this course during a pandemic. Then each senior will be introduced and show examples of his or her work in the show. Each will talk briefly about their motivation and process behind the art. We will then open up the panel to questions from the audience to each other and close with a few reminders about upcoming art events and gallery hours for our current exhibitions. Before we begin, I would like to remind students uh, attending this virtual artist talk uh, who, are, who wish to receive a visual FAE to follow these instructions. During the talk, a code will appear on the screen for five minutes. At that time, please click the link in the video description and fill out the form that comes up. If you have any issues, please email fae at csbsju.edu. Okay. Maybe what we'll do right now then is have uh, Joe talk a little about the experience. Joe Singwald, you are on. Thank you, Jill. Um, I was first introduced to these students a few years ago um, when they had an exhibition for their sophomore topics class. And I remember being impressed with the quality of their work then and how well they carried themselves as they talked about their work um, during the uh, opening reception. And it was a day or two after that that I saw their professor, Rachel Mellis, um, on campus and I just remember telling her how excited I was uh, to see what they would continue to uh, make at their time at CSB SJU. Um, little did I know then that I would be working with them during their final semester a couple of years later. So, um, With COVID, the college uh, switched to a block schedule, which proved to be a challenge I felt for this class. Suddenly, um, 
this change compressed all the class content into just four weeks. And it really seemed like everybody was sharing their work mostly online via Zoom, you know, maybe every three days. And it just seemed like there was a uh, little time to breathe. Um, but positive takeaway um, I witnessed was a rapid growth and evolution of these ideas that they're working on. A uh, response to in-class criticism to strengthen specific pieces was, like, was observed, you know, in a matter of days opposed to weeks perhaps. And in, in the end, I was really blown away how much stronger everyone's work was um, at the end of these four weeks from when we started, you know, um, just from their concentration on spending a lot of time making work, developing ideas. It was really apparent four weeks later. So I'm excited for you guys to meet uh, these artists and their art. And I don't know that we're ready to, to uh, introduce them quite yet. Okay. So I think what we're going to do is um, go, go to directly to the students' work and have each of them um, talk about their in individual work. So Zoe, how about if you start us off? Um, all right, hello everyone. Um, I'm Zoe and aside from the technical difficulties, I'm glad you guys can all see the artwork. So this is the first in my exhibition. It is titled Territory. Um, I made a series of self-portraits this year, um, something that I have been um, shying away from before, but I think that it's important for women to be able to reclaim their own bodies um, that have historically and also in modern times been seen as sexual objects um, and have been portrayed in museums and in art history, as well as in contemporary media as sexual objects um, under the male gaze. Um, not everyone knows what the male gaze is, but um, within the artist community, we recognize that um, often artworks have been made for the male pleasure and for the male viewership um, because women were not kept in mind when it came to um, creating a beautiful image. My artworks attempt to confront the male gaze. Um, in this artwork territory, the hand extends in front as an invasion, as a confrontation, as a statement of power and reclamation. In the next artwork, um, this one is called Still. This one is an exposure on the woman's mind. It is a showcase of the potential, the capacity, the strength, the complexity that rests inside of every female um, and I think that this is a narrative that was left out in art history and is often left out when female characters are portrayed in film, in stories. Um, females are often portrayed as the temptress or the seductress um, or a mother figure always to serve the male. And so in this artwork, the, the mind is highlighted while the body recedes into shape and color and form. In my next artwork called Divine Revisited, I am expanding upon Sarah Lucas's self-portrait called Divine, um, where Sarah Lucas, although you all, I assume are unfamiliar with this artwork, it was a feminist piece done in, in the last um, couple uh, decades. And um, it was using masculinity from the female perspective as a tool of reclamation of power and this artwork, Divine Revisited, says that it's okay to use femininity as a woman to reclaim power and not have to, by default, use masculinity um, as a symbol of agency. And so this artwork exposes the viewership and asks the viewers to question why they're looking where they're looking, what the implications are of their gaze and what they can do to examine their own viewership, morality. And my final image, Agency, is a conclusion on this exploration that I was doing with the images of the female body. How can I 
show that women have agency in their own lives and in their own space and environments and in their relationships with men, in their relationships with other women. And so my uh, take on the, uh, the image of a hand is to claim power. And um, as you can see, the space is at the woman's mercy. Space is um, a tool for the woman and she has the ability to reclaim her own livelihood. And so I just wanted to thank you all for coming and uh, despite the um, issues, but hopefully you guys can all come see these in person. They are 40 by 26, so they're pretty big. And um, I hope that you may examine your own relationship with women in your life. Thank you. And then next um, we have the incredible Molly Meyer. Thank you, Zoe. Hello, I'm Molly, and my art for the show is about creating sketches based on the news. So over the past several months, I've looked at the news almost every day and created a sketch based on the first couple news stories that came up on my phone. I went into this project wanting to do something with the fact that so much has happened over the past year which I'm sure we're all aware of the certain things that have happened. Um, and I was really determined to examine these stories and to be more aware of what's been happening around me, to really pay attention to these stories and not brush them off as just yet another news story, which is kind of what I had been doing before doing these sketches. And so much has been happening that I hope that when I'm older, I'll be able to turn to these sketches as a way to remember the times. Um, they're kind of like a little journal, uh, just with drawings rather than writing. And I also have dates and the titles on the backs of them. So I'll be able to remember when I created them and what specific story they're based on. Um, so on the screen, there's a handful of these sketches, and in the actual show, they're on a monitor with images alternating with other images, just because I have a lot of sketches that I wanted to show. And next, I also did a handful of self-portraits. So on the screen, I have a series of five self-portraits that I chose out of the ones that I did during this project. And these are to show my reactions to the stories on a given day, because as you can imagine, doing a drawing based on the news almost every day can be extremely draining. So these kind of act as my own way of putting more of myself into my project and as a way to interpret the events through my own emotions. Um, and now I'll hand it off to Abby Peddle. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Abby Peddle and my work is not on screen yet. There it is, okay. So my work centralizes on voice, emotions, and words as a means of personal reflection on the human condition. Uh, whenever I am overcome with emotion, like a bottle of soda shaken and about to burst, and I have no other way of expressing myself, I put my experience into short and sweet, like little impactful packages. And in this work, Who Am I? I talk about the self, specifically morphing into who I am. And I chose visual aids to immerse the viewer in the words themselves, allowing their eyes to effortlessly follow along. And this work is about the battle we all face. Who am I? Uh, the struggle of wanting to find a place to fit while also remaining unique. Uh, it is in the process you find the beauty as the self is ever changing, never remaining stagnant. And moving on to my next work, uh, my film Gilded. Uh, 
since high school, I became fascinated with the concept of gilding in which you take an ordinary object and cover it in gold or a precious metal to seemingly increase its value. And I tried this on stationary objects, yet I myself was struggling uh, with inner battles of worth. And what, what, what better way to test this theory than as an artist to paint myself? And I realized the worth of an object is what you make it. And I realized that self-love is not something you just wake up one day feeling. It is like a staircase or a mountain you must climb. And in those little steps you take, you may go from a negative viewpoint to neutrality, then to acceptance, and then at the peak is self-love. And it's just this ongoing journey. And it's celebrating those flaws and imperfections that makes us human and those confusing and sometimes ugly, but yet beautiful emotions. And as with all my work, there is a vulnerability and a rawness. And while creating this work, I was uncomfortable a lot of the times showing my body and face on full display. And I found myself getting nitpicky about certain shots, wishing I could just blur my imperfections away. And I realized that it's in those imperfections that my work rings true, that you can't take the gold from inside of me. And moving on to my next work. Once we can find the love within ourselves, we are able to extend that love to others, as you will experience in my work, time spent in the library. It's about that feeling you get when you meet someone for the first time, yet you feel like you've known them forever. And to reflect on the things we love about ourselves only allows us to discover what we love about other people. That love then impounds on itself into this glorious culmination of love. And through my work, I hope that you can reflect on the meaning of love and how it relates to the self and how in order to find your best self, you must embrace imperfection to find your true sense of worth. Thank you. Uh, and now I would like to introduce my colleague, Mackenzie Scherhammer. Hello. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, I'm Kenzie Scherhammer and I am an art education major. Um, so when thinking about um, my project, I really want to incorporate my love for education um, and ceramics. So I created this project called the Kindliness Mug Exchange. Um, and so what I did was I reached out to roughly 60 CSB SJU um, education students and I sent them a survey and I got back like roughly like 40 responses from the survey. And on this survey, I asked them a couple questions to fill out, um, which was gonna pertain to my project. Um, and on the survey, I asked them why they wanted to become teachers. Um, I asked them to describe one word or to give me one word that would describe their teaching values and say and tell me why they selected that word. And I also asked them to tell me about what they were most worried about for student teaching. Um, so with these responses, I created an individualized mug for each of those teachers who gave me that response. Um, the reason why um, this is a mug exchange is because by them sending me um, a response from the survey, um, they are getting a mug in exchange. So I got to get to know them a little bit better. And so it was kind of like a story mug exchange. Um, and so if you can kind of see like with these slides, I have 40 of these mugs, but in the exhibition, I only have six of them. And on these slides, I only have four of them. Um, but on the front of the mug, I decided to put the word that each person had selected um, and then put the word teach. So I have teach inclusion, teach kindness, teach creativity, um, let's see, com teach com compassion, teach respect, all these different words that people were giving me. Um, and then on the back, I had written, you got this as a response to what people were saying, um, but they were worried about for student teaching. 
So the front was kind of to display their teaching values um, and them as a teacher. And on the back was a kind of like a, like a friendly kind reminder that you got this, even though you're a little bit worried about student or teaching in the future, um, just know that you're gonna do, you're gonna be an amazing teacher and you got this. Um, and so I also decided to make each mug unique and different with like bright fun colors and also making um, the bodies of the mugs in different, like slightly different um, shapes and forms. Um, and I did this because I care about who responded to me. And so in a sense, I wanted to show them that I care about them. So I took the time um, to create a unique mug just for them. Um, I loved doing this project um, because I got to make connections with pe new people that I probably wouldn't have gotten to talk to or get to know if I hadn't done uh, this project. Um, ideally, I would have liked to, you know, sit down with them with like a cup of coffee and have like a conversation one on one. But because of COVID, I really had to just send out that survey, um, get to know them that way. Um, and so then after um, this exhibition, I will be sending these mugs off to the people who responded to the survey. I have like 40 of them. They'll be getting a little gift basket for me. Um, and overall, I just had so much fun making it. Um, and so without further ado, I would love to introduce my friend and colleague, Christian Belko, Belko, sorry, Balco. <laughs> Hello everyone, thank you so much for being here today. So a little bit about my artwork. So I focus on something called land art or earthworks, which is a certain type of art movement and style about working with the earth and working with the land and being able to make art from it. So my process for this project was originally inspired through a Japanese style of art called Hikaru Dorudengo which means shiny mud dumpling. Now you might be like, oh my gosh, these aren't shiny. Oh my gosh, what is this? This kid just made mud balls. Now, technically, yes, I did just make mud balls, but it's about the entire process about me, myself, and I going into the woods, taking hours on a daily basis, harvesting all these materials. Now, throughout my process, I've had many break on me, many crack, figuring out what works, what doesn't work, what type of earth works for this form. So it was really interesting to experience and grow closer to mud as a material and an art form. So the shift of hex, this first image you see in front of you, is really fascinating. I love the wood. The wood creates a balance and an imbalance, an imperfection, and really holds and stabilizes these mud balls. Now, although I never actually got to make an actually shiny or polished mud ball, you can look at the work of Bruce Gardner, who's been doing this for many years, and he has fabulous items. So in this piece itself, I've had many break, many fall, especially during the installation process. Now my next piece is called White Balls of Baron. And so this piece itself was fascinating to work with because I found some white clay. And so right in the corner of the image, you can see part of a white clay ball. And so that's something I've been working with and I've worked with and I had many more except they all tended to roll off the pedestal when I was setting it up. So this is the work that you have in front of you right now. And it is what it is because of the process of it. And so I loved working with the clay itself and the mud to create these two pieces of art. Now, in the end, I harvested all of these from the forest. And so eventually, I will take all of these materials and the ones I have back in my room back into the woods to complete a cycle from my self-harvesting and then returning them all back to where they belong. So thank you all for listening. The next artist we have is Justin Beeren. Hi, 
Hi, everyone. I'm Justin Biren. Um, yeah, so I primarily focus on pottery and then within pottery, the functionality of it. And so whenever I'm making work um, on the kick wheel, I am constantly trying to think of how I can, what I can make to be that someone can be used in their home and using their everyday life, because that is why I make what I do. Um, pottery to me is a way to communicate with a user. Someone, um, pottery is a way, sorry, pottery is a way that you can communicate with a viewer. The viewer then becomes a user of the work. And then within that, I broke that down into how I wanted to elevate and make people want to use a piece. And so through that, I have my additions of texture and then also little stamps that I put on the piece. So then when you're turning the work around in your hand, you are constantly seeing it from a different angle, different side, and then it becomes a different work. And so um, I also wanted to become a part of the piece from start to finish, uh, really take a step back and kind of like how Christian like uh, talked about uh, finding your own materials and using them and creating work from that. So the clay body is actually dug from my own house um, in New Prague, Minnesota. And so I dug that this summer and I processed it. And so, and for the past, semester and a half, I worked with that clay and I made it into usable fireball clay that I then um, would put this, that I then put this glaze, glaze over that I created out of tree ash glaze from St. Joseph, Minnesota. And so my work is the culmination of me as a potter. It is from, it is the body of the clay is the work from my home where I grew up, where I started pottery in high school, where I fell in love with it. And then the glaze is that ex shiny exterior that then finishes the work off. And that glaze came from St. Joseph, Minnesota here where I became the potter I am today because of it. And so I really wanted to attack the idea of the organic um, through the use of glazes and the clay, but also branch off into the geometric, the melt molding and meddling of the old with the new. And so through that, I would, these are the works that I created, the spherical shapes, the triangles, the addition of texture. It almost seems out of place at first, but then when you add, when the clay drip, the glaze dripping down, and then also the form overall the the old and the new have now become married together and then again that entices a viewer to become a user pick it up turn it in their hands use it in their everyday life because that is, to me is what pottery is supposed to be the they someone wakes up and they pick up a cup that i threw and they can feel right where i pulled the clay up and formed it into that cup they then put it to their lips and they drink from it. It's this idea of intimacy, this unspoken language of art, just even if the potter isn't there to explain it, they're able to touch and feel exactly where the potter um, felt when they were making the work. And yeah, that's about it. The next artist that we have is the amazing Elizabeth Boyd. Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, this artwork that you see on your screens right now is the first image of my series titled Hominem Te Memento, after the Latin meaning, remember you are a human. And to me, this series of images comprised of four digitally altered film photo photographs, excuse me, explore the emotional uncertainty that I feel is universal in times of disparity, much like this one. And so 
these photos are ones that I took about a year and a half ago now, um, just months before the outbreak of the pandemic um, in Italy and Greece. And I decided to explore um, this theme of permanence versus impermanence and how that functions within um, the relationship of temporality or a series of uh, moments that progress after one another in between humanity and ideas. And so I've explored this through religious imagery and ancient architecture because um, these are themes that are important to me as an individual. Um, and I believe that they harness the gravity of time very well. Um, and so what I started to do with these images was I looked at them and I started to take them apart individually and create these sort of fragments um, and piece them back up together again in order to form different narratives within the images that you're seeing um, that aim to capture the confusion and at times I think frantic feelings that we take on as we face loss either through memory, time, or even death. And so um, my goal with this series is to <laughs> capture that emotional introspective reflection um, that happens within each one of us as we're confronted with our own mortality or ideas of loss. And so <laughs> I think that I would like each individual to not just examine what's happening within the composition of each image, but what's happening within their own emotional response to what you're seeing. And thank you once again, all for coming. And I would like to introduce my wonderful colleague, Maria Hernandez Chair. Hello, everyone. And I just wanted to say thank you for coming. Um, so for my senior thesis, I wanted to focus ab about like political art and systematic racism. Um, I think that this has been quite a challenge because I am not usually one to do this type of artwork, but thanks to a lot of my colleagues and my professors and my friends and family, I come to realize that I don't need to apologize for my artwork. This is um, what you see and this is my message to everyone. Um, so my main goal for these two pieces, um, one being called Chaos and the other one being called Trump Child was to call out a specific political leader who has made a some comments um, that involved that some comments that I don't feel that were right involving African Americans, Hispanics, Native Americans, Muslim immigrants, women, and people with disabilities. Um, his statements have reflected on his behavior from public acts and have created a widespread of issues. With these two pieces, I really showed uh, my own story and a vulnerability about my story of being an undocumented student um, and person living in the US. Um, I really reflected and I really wanted to, people to see of what children are going through um, that are Hispanic and that are in cages and how it's not right. And how people in the Latin community don't come to this country to cause any harm to anyone um, like myself. I'm just here to get an education and just um, share my ideas with people. And I really wanted to show people that um, a lot of immigrants, their stories are important and it should be told. Um, for my next slide, um, the reason why I chose to do political posters was because I wanted people to just go out and kind of just, you know, just um, express their opinions on how they feel living in a country that's predominantly dominated by white people. And um, I think it's important to hear their stories and just um, just be mindful of what people go through. Um, 
sorry, can you go to my next slide? Yeah, thank you. Um, so my process was mostly looking on the news and being just, just go out there and ask people their stories and what they feel like is most important to them to be shared to the world. I use spray paint and stencils kind of, I kind of got the idea from one of my biggest influencers, Banksy, and I thought that his style was just very unique and it's very raw. And I think it really catches people's attention of just sharing his message of what he thinks the world looks into his eyes. Um, and I think I kind of really liked the way that these turned out. Um, my goal wasn't to make them elegant. It was more to make, I wanted to, I wanted to make them more um, intense. Um, the final push for me to actually go through this idea was over the summer um, with the whole George Floyd case and the frustration that many people went through. I just wanted to just go for it. And I'm really proud um, on how they turned out. And yeah, thank you guys. Um, but now I would like to introduce one of my colleagues, Kai Ying Li. Hi everyone, thank you for coming. Um, I'm Kai Ying Li, but many would know me as Bruce. Um, during uh, uh, my time here, uh, I've been focusing on uh, my culture, the Hmong culture uh, uh, specifically. So what you see here uh, uh, is uh, sculptures made of Jaws paper and Jaws paper is made out of uh, coarse bamboo or rice uh, uh, paper. And uh, the image uh, you see currently on the slide is uh, the ring. Uh, the ring is an instrument uh, played uh, in traditional uh, courting um, and for funerals. Um, uh, the basic uh, of this instrument is uh, uh, for funeral purposes uh, is to help guide the spirits uh, to their next journey, which is uh, to the afterlife. Um, which is a, a very uh, a special way of, of, of a human being uh, evil, being able to talk to the spirit and guiding them. And on my next slide, uh, what you see is a rice shifter. Uh, rice shifter, uh, we use it for many purposes in the home culture. Um, for instance, uh, with the rice, uh, we use it to uh, pick out rice seeds that are uh, rotten and uh, we just pick them out and we just shift the uh, shifter up and down until it's a com completed process. Yeah, but for my case, uh, uh, it's uh, more related to uh, uh, funeral purposes as uh, this is also used to help guide the uh, final process of the spirits to the afterlife. And the instance that you see on the uh, the rice shifter, they're meant to be burned as a, a sign of respect uh, to, the, to the deceased uh, uh, person. And on the next slide uh, is uh, a title of this offering as it is an offering to, uh, to my ancestors or anyone's ancestors um, as these paper bowls will be uh, burnt uh, uh, as money. And as you see, uh, the gold one in the front, which represents gold, like gold bars, gold ingots. And there are silver ones in there too, since uh, it's kind of hard to see based on the lighting. Uh, and overall, uh, during uh, the process, uh, doing all the folding for the boats took about two weeks at most, uh, spending about five to six hours in the studio just uh, folding these. Um, so I have uh, like hundreds of these in the uh, the studio. And I, and I would just uh, like to thank you, uh, everyone, for coming. And I would now like to um, introduce my colleague, Madeline Moko. Thank you, Bruce. Um, so my work is based off of my study abroad experience in Greece and Italy, and it is entitled Crescita Atraverso Viaggiare, which means growth through travel. Um, 
one of the big things that I looked at while creating this piece was the idea of memory and like and <laughs> past lives and the idea of home. I really felt this experience in Italy helped that highlight be highlighted in my life. I just felt like I had been there before the moment I stepped off the plane in my first destination. And I felt it even more throughout the weeks that I was there. And it was something that I had never felt before. And it kind of reminded me of the experience that someone would have if they'd known that they've been through this before, such as like a past life. And I really tried to use my own photographs to create this book. Um, each of the photographs are from different places in Italy, and I really tried to compile them so that they fit with the emotions that I felt in each of these places. I felt more comfortable there than I do here. I felt that this was something that I was meant to experience. And you don't realize how lucky your life is until you go through one of these experiences and you feel that your life is in the right direction, you're going in the right direction because you feel this sense of completion. And I use the vellum, a transparent vellum over each of the photographs to represent memory and the curling of the vellum is to reveal the photographs underneath, such as how I experienced Italy in the moment. And the vellum is supposed to represent that memory now that we are a year and a half out from that trip. And the interesting thing about this book is that it took me several tries to get it to work in a way that was cohesive. Um, and one of the big things, and the reason that it's presented in this way as like a sculpture is because the binding is so intricate that I really wanted to highlight that. And I don't know that I've seen a lot of book art in the student shows. And so I really wanted to do something different and they're all handwritten pages. I didn't want it to be mass produced. I wanted it to be unique and one of a kind. And that's really something that I tried to focus on while making this piece. And I am just so grateful for this experience and the ability to show off this book that I've been working on for months now. And I want to thank everyone for coming out today and to hear us talk. And I hope that you all get to see this in person. Up next is my colleague, Kara Mullen. Hi there. Uh, thank you all so much for coming uh, virtually. It's so great uh, to be able to speak about our artwork. We've all worked super hard and super excited to share it with you. Um, so. I have two pieces in the gallery right now. The first is titled student and the next is titled teacher. Um, I uh, am one of the art ed students, I think one of three in this exhibition. Um, and I'm currently going through my student teaching experience. And when we began the uh, sort of configuration of what we thought these projects might look like way back in the fall, um, I was really struggling with um, creating art at that point because of the year and because of just feeling heaviness in my heart because of everything that's gone on. And um, my project actually started out looking completely different. Um, but this is sort of what I have ended up with after going through this super complicated experience with exploring how art relates to me personally as an artist. Um, and so initially my goal was to retrace my steps and sort of find a way through the art making process to reach into 
my childhood creativity and the sort of innate cre creativity that one has as a kid before you have a concept of what is right and wrong in art making, before you have a concept of this is good and this is not. And um, I really was trying to do that initially to find a way to empathize with my students um, and work better with them and understand, you know, what their relationship is to art at this point in their lives. Because um, I have, you know, 20 years of experience more than they do. And that's really changed the way that I feel about art, that I make art, that I experience art. And so I was really trying to meet them where they are at right now. Um, and as time went on, I sort of realized that in a lot of ways, my experience as an artist has held me back um, in the sense that I often have to tell my students, they will come to me and they will say, I can't do this. I can't make art. I'm not a good artist or I'm not an artist and I, I can't do it. And so they just freeze and they stop. And I feel like in a lot of ways that happens to us as adults is we've created this idea of art being something that's vocational and art being something that there is either a good or a bad. And I think with this project, I was really uh, trying to focus on the idea of creating is good and creating should be for the artist. And it doesn't have to be a good creativity or a bad creativity. And really there is no such thing. If you are making for yourself and you are making because you love to make, then you should be allowed to make. And I, I think in, in a way I'm trying to challenge uh, the idea that um, art has limits. And in reality, um, what I'm trying to say here is that I don't think it does. Um, and so the piece on the bottom, teacher, is the piece that came along first. And this is the version of art that was made with myself in mind. Um, and, and it's an idea that I originally developed and thought about and was really excited about when I was in fifth grade in elementary school. And I remember thinking, I want to use crayons in an artistic way, but I don't wanna draw with them. I wanna work with them differently. And I have thought about that for so many years and thought, I really wanna start that project. I really wanna do that project. And it's something that I have always had a passion to start and never did. Um, so at the end of my uh, experience in the fall, I ended up trying that when I hit a roadblock. And I think that in a lot of ways, working through this project, and letting go and focusing on this thing that I was really excited about and really wanted to be doing was just what I was needing because it allowed me to let go of all of the stress of being a college uh, level artist and move into the innate creativity that I was trying to find in the first place. Um, and so I actually went about finding crayons and just melting them to canvas um, and no rhyme or reason um, but just me and my heart and my creativity flowing onto a canvas. Um, that really spoke to me because this is a culmination of both that creativ creativity that I have in me, as well as, um, you know, the aesthetic decisions and the knowledge that I have about art, um, sort of influencing color theory and the way that I decided to put things together. Um, and so, that's sort of how that piece developed. And as that was happening, I had this second canvas and I was thinking, you know, what am I, what am I gonna do here? How am I gonna create this piece that represents what teaching is to me, what creativity is to me and what art is to me. And what I ended up doing is as I was melting the crayons for the teacher artwork, um, I started using the second canvas to catch all of the extra drippings. And that ended up being my second art piece because it sort of represented the way that a teacher influences the creativity of the student, but also the way that a student doesn't need to take all of the knowledge that the teacher has and make art in a certain kind of way. Um, this represented sort of the free flowing creativity that students do have. Um, and I believe that we shouldn't teach them out of. 
Um, and so this is a project that was really uh, close to my heart and has really influenced the way that I've thought about teaching as well as art making. Um, and so, yeah, uh, thank you so much for coming. And uh, we are about to move on to the discussions portion of our evening. So if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Um, I uh, thank you all for being, uh, thank you to the panelists, uh, our seniors who are rolling with it beautifully um, and sharing uh, the information about your art and your process. And um, we do invite uh, questions from uh, our audience. And also if uh, you have questions that you wanna ask your colleagues, um, you certainly could do that as well. Um, one question that I have that whoever wants to respond to uh, is with COVID happening, I, I can see some of the influences uh, echoing in your artwork, but I, I would love to just hear how the pandemic influenced your art practices um, and, and maybe uh, how you, not only how you made your art or how, the type of art that you created, if anybody wants to speak to that. I can speak a little bit about my experience. Um, I was home last semester just because I wanted to be extra cautious. Um, and so it made the making of the art a lot harder. Um, it made it very difficult to get the resources I needed. Um, as a photographer, it's easier to print on campus where I can see it coming out. Um, and last semester I had outsourced it to one of the student workers um, for the technician position. And it was just a lot harder because I was noticing things that was a lot harder for her to probably notice um, because it was my photography and so I knew how I wanted it to print, which made it a little more difficult. Um, and it made it harder to do that trial and error to make sure that it was printing the way I wanted it to print in order to put it into the book format. I can also talk about my project too. So I wanted to do kind of like a socially engaged project during a pandemic. I was like, oh no, what did I get myself into? Um, but I really wanted to do it. So um, for me, it was more of, I kind of had to switch up some of my ideas, some of like the refined details of, I originally wanted to create these like mugs with um, like current teachers in the St. Cloud School District um, with the same idea of, you know, talking to them, giving them, giving them the gift, um, the mug as a gift. But, you know, you can't really even like walk into a school um, if you're not working there, if you're not a student. Um, so that was kind of a challenge. So then I, you know, had to change my idea to CSPSU students, but still it was, you know, in the fall, like we really couldn't, like we could barely go over to St. John's, like all that. Um, there was a lot of conflicts with that. Um, so ha just having to like work off of making sure everything was going to be safe to like interact with people but also in a way where I could still be able to kind of communicate and get what I needed um, for this project. So, yeah. Thank you, Kenzie. Uh, does anyone feel like it, uh, in terms of uh, creativity, uh, how, how did it affect, how can you see the pandemic affecting your creativity or how you approach something? Yes, I wanted to answer this question as well. Um, that's a really good follow-up question as well, Jill. Um, I think that creativity for me in COVID um, became something that I expected of myself 
which I think that no artist should be doing. Um, <laughs> not even an art major, not even when it's a project um, that you're supposed to do. You know, I think that once you start to box in your um, identity at all, and you start to expect that, you know, you are a person that has to create to have value, um, especially in a time where creating is very difficult, um, according to like resources that we have access to, according to time management, um, emotional, mental health management. Um, it's super hard to make things right now. Um, this past year has been so hard on all of us. And so I think that that's something I had to realize is that I had to find more balance in my life without creativity being um, the only way that I found um, value in my time. But yeah, that's my take on creativity. Yeah, so so while a lot of people, um, many of the artists, it seems like that I spoke to throughout this year, um, spoke to how the art sometimes became meditative for them and if they could lose themselves in it without perhaps what you're saying, Zoe, the expectation um, or, or even what you were saying, Kara, about it has to be a certain way, but allowing uh, also the experience to happen. If it was a way for you to um, relax or, um, I don't know, find, find uh your own take like like Molly did with her daily sketches. Although, as you said, as you committed to those Molly, um, it, was, it was hard some days to do that. Would you want to speak a little bit more about that, Molly? Yeah, sure. So I kind of started doing daily sketches even before the pandemic happened, just because in college, I didn't have a whole lot of time dedicated to making art. So kind of going off of what Kara and Zoe were talking about, um, I kind of changed my style in order to start making art more, but it's less about making it look perfect and more about just making art for the sake of making art. So I think with the pandemic, um, I mean, I was still making these daily sketches, but making them based on the news and forcing myself to look at the bad things happening in the world at, you know, every day. It was a lot to handle. And so I ended up making more self-portraits as kind of more of like a self-reflection period and to get my mind off of the bad news and to like focus more on myself. So that was your way of, of finding a bit of balance as Zoe was talking about earlier too, because the news and just focusing on that so much can, can be very uh, difficult and anxiety um, producing. So, um, and Madeline, when you were, thank you so much, Molly. Madeline, when you were talking earlier too uh, about your process and how you had to rely on the print technician at the college to do some of the printing for you. Um, that was also something that Scott Murphy talked about with the faculty uh, exhibition that is now up over at St. Ben's that not only did he need to design the piece, but he also had to design it in such a way that he could uh, relay the information um, of how to install it and uh, I think as an artist, and you guys, um, I'm sure will attest to this as well, it's constant um, asking of questions of yourself. How do I do this? Um, how do I make this clear? How do I communicate this? Um, art is, is questioning things so much. And um, I, I thank you. I thank you for your feedback, all of you. Does anybody else want to um, contribute to the COVID uh, and art question? We, we have I, one. I was oh. just gonna say, regardless, this is gonna be um, a record of you know, their life right now during COVID, even if it's directly affected or not. But looking back years down the road, this it's a documentation of um, what we've all been 
what they've been going through in the last year or so, and um, which I guess you can say about art in general, but I think it's even more so during the pandemic, so. Um, Absolutely, yeah. And, and sometimes you don't see it, um, really what it was telling you even until years later. So save it, definitely save it. Um, we have one question for that was submitted. And um, I just wanna say it, that it was, oh, there's another one, there's two, I missed it. Um, one was answered, the other one is from Carol um, in which she said, um, Carol Brash wanted to ask, how is art an important part of human development, our drive to create and express an expression of the human condition, as well as being a potential profession. Does anyone want to, again, how is art an important part of human development? So, and Christian and uh, Kenzie, you can hop in on this. Kenzie, you've probably had uh, development more recently than I have, but the um, a lot of what I've found and experienced when working with kids and working with kids in art is that creating, especially in the younger age levels, probably K through five, is a lot about exploring and understanding how things work in the world and understanding, you know, how is that paint going to drip? How is that charcoal going to smudge? How do I mix colors together? How do I do things? And um, I think developmentally in a lot of ways, it's just about um, reflecting on the world around us, experiencing the world around us, as well as taking time to reflect, especially in the older age levels, middle school through high school, um, about how art um, allows us to sort of meditate um, and think about how our world is affecting us and how we are affecting the world at the same time. Um, and so going through that process definitely developmentally is, uh, you know, great for social emotional learning and also uh, great for those things like fine motor, gross motor, um, and just like general, like experiencing the world, you know, it's so fascinating if you've done any uh, research on human development between the ages of being a newborn and like the age of five children are learning constantly just by experiencing the world. And I don't know if you've ever noticed, but kids often like to put things in their mouths or uh, you know, feel it in their hands because they're trying to find as many ways as possible to take in that information. Um, and you know, it's, it really is you know, also an expression of the human condition. And that's so important, uh, you know, especially for those middle school, high school ages. Uh, but it, it, I find that it, you lose some of that uh, curiosity about the world when you reach the uh, developmental stage that begins at fifth grade to seventh grade, about that point when students start to compare uh, their artwork to other students. And that's when you, know, you really start to hit a roadblock. And I think a lot of times, even if artists are super talented or even if you know, you're a, a middle school to high school artist who is doing very well, um, if it's not the best, or if it's not, you know, what you believe to be like the most amazing in the room, uh, that really becomes a roadblock and prevents you from moving forward with it. And I think that that's really a shame uh, for a lot of students. And that's sort of where my art uh, journey went. Uh, for that is that I think a lot of times artists, even our age, college age students, um, struggle with the idea of like not having the most uh, refined looking project or not having the most uh, developed at that point. Um, and I, that really is because a lot of times we do think of it as being uh, purely vocational. And I, I think we need to challenge that idea a little bit more. I don't know if that answers the question uh, fully, but uh, does somebody else want to add anything to that? I'd like to add something. Um, so for me personally, I, I, I love this question. Thank you, Carol, I miss you. Um, <laughs> so uh, for me, my, my art 
often centralizes on the human condition. And uh, I think a lot of us can relate, like growing up, um, we all know uh, art is an expression, like people off, you know, like it's people think like artists make it to express themselves and that's totally true. But I know for me and a lot of my colleagues can probably relate to this is as an artist, people kind of expect you to just kind of be making art all the time and they may make demands of you and say like, oh, can you make me this? Or can you make me that? Or can you just, can you just do this? And uh, a lot of the times like people will reach out to you with these um, like crazy requests for art. And it's just like, uh, like <laughs> it's well, one, sometimes it's not even in your expertise and two art um, doesn't just like always flow naturally from your hands, from your body, from your spirit, from your mind. Uh, and I think that's something that non-artists don't really understand is that um, I can't just like wake up and make art. Like people will say, oh, you're bo bored, just go draw something. And it's it's not like that. It's It's gotta come from inside. It's gotta come from your heart. You have to have an inspiration. And that's really what leads to the human development, to the human expression is once you find that passion, once you find that inspiration, then you can express it. And then that in turn allows you to express yourself and reflect and become more of who you are. Like that's definitely um, how I uh, use my work is as, as an outlet to express myself and finding pieces of myself that wouldn't otherwise be there. Thank you, Abby. I, I also think when you are inspired, um, it's also a combination of, of doing the work and, and not uh, just living in your head with it. I mean, sometimes we can marinate much too long before we actually, um, you know, actually get down to it. But um, I really connect with your sense of, of it needs to come from within. Um, it needs to have that passion. And, and I know uh, from talking to you guys during the installation um, about the critiques and so on too, all of your art professors were um, often encouraging you to, how do you make it yours? How do you find your voice? And I think you just spoke to that very beautifully. Okay, well, you, um, I think it's time um, for us, it's, a, it's about time to, to wrap up. And I really, really uh, thank all of you uh, who have tuned in today to support um, these wonderful people that you know, whether I wanna thank our parents um, of these brilliant people for supporting them um, throughout their stages of being interested in art and also um, throughout their, their college career here. Um, I, I know that although the video um, or this whole thing didn't roll like we wanted it to roll, we will create a, a video um, with the slides and put that into the posted talk that will appear um, on the art department and the fine arts. Um, visual arts page, um, as well as we will share that with each of you seniors so that you may pass it on in that way too. Um, a few things that I just want to say in conclusion is I, I do want to do a special shout out to our um, senior gallery assistants who um, are, are graduating this year and who have been so vital in helping with making the gallery things go on and two of them today are Elizabeth Boyd who has been with the gallery for three years and also Kai Ying Lee who has been with us for four years and I thank you. I could not do what I do without you and congratulations to you on your show and um, for your work in the galleries. I want to remind people 
uh, to please visit the St. John's Art Center um, to see this wonderful exhibit of SOAR. And um, the, the gallery hours are 11 to 4, uh, Tuesday through Friday. And now we are uh, starting tomorrow, also open from 1 to 4 at both galleries. And um, we continue to encourage you to wear your masks and to social distance and both galleries uh, have a limit of 12 people in there at a time. Um, and we recommend around a 15 minute visit. Uh, the other exhibit, when you come up or when you go to see uh, this uh, exhibit of seniors, please also consider going over to the St. Ben's campus where the faculty exhibition is going on through May 20th. Um, these are the people that inspired your people. And um, the show is up, as I said, through May 20th and the same hours um, apply except um, in days, except that we're open just a tiny bit later over there until 4.30. So if you have any questions about any of this, you can also go to the websites in, um, at the Fine Arts Programming Visual Art page. Uh, and um, in connection, just lastly, with the, with the faculty exhibition, Carol Brash, uh, who was one of the wonderful people who asked a question this evening, is the, uh, this afternoon, uh, CSBSJU art history professor will be doing a talk on Chinese gardens on May 10th, and that will be about a 30 minute talk. Um, with time for questions and answers included in that. So uh, that will be at May 10th at 5 p.m. So um, I think the very, very last thing is some of the art at both of the galleries, the senior exhibition, as well as um, the faculty exhibition are for sale. And if you want more information about that, you can contact the galleries or the individual artists. So anybody out there in the senior realm here want to say anything else in our conclusion? OK, again, thank you all for sharing your art. Thank you, audience, for sharing your time. And uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. And everybody wave. Goodbye.